How many of you here, all right, I guess I was thinking about this question and I, I figured I'd, I'd rather ask it in the negative because it might be the best way. How many people here have never used a computer or a smartphone? You have never touched one. Just raise your hands. Not a single person. Hallelujah. I chose the right place to be this morning. Here's the deal. All of you have used a computer or a smartphone. How many of you have ever had an issue with one? <coughs> All right, keep your hands up. I want to see. I want to make sure I can understand who I'm talking to this morning. All right, I'd say that it's pretty much... Most of you, if not all of you, have had an issue with your computer or your phone, your smartphone. You know, usually, you know, back in the day when they weren't called smart, you, you didn't have so many issues with them. Now, now there are smartphones, they come with more problems. So, usually when you come up with an issue with your computer or your smartphone, you tend to go seek some IT support, you know? Information technology, I need some technicians to help me out. I need somebody that's a genius, right, like the Apple Genius Bar. I need somebody that's a geek, like, the, you know, Best Buy Geek Squad. I need somebody to help me out. And for most of us, IT turns out to be our nine-year-old daughters. Some of you? It's inc they, they know more than you do. And, and they've been alive a fraction of the time that you have. But it's okay. So you go to this IT department whoever it ends up being, and you tell them you have an issue, and what is the first, Mike, why do you guys do this? Why do IT folks do this, right? The first question that comes out of their mouths is, well, have you tried rebooting it? Have you tried restarting it? Is that true? Yep, yep I got an A-OK -okay from the IT department over here. Have you tried rebooting it? Have you tried restarting that computer, that smartphone? And every time I hear that question, I remember working in, in, in corporate America, I'd call IT with an issue on my computer. That was the first, I'd get so offended. I'd get offended, I'm like, yes, no, no, I didn't think to do that, right? Like, I'm calling you because I did that and it's not working and now I need you to help me. But it tends to be the first question that they ask because in fact, the longer your computer or your phone goes without being shut down or restarted, the more likely it is to start experiencing issues. You know, they say you're supposed to sh shut your phone off at night, right? Like turn it off and turn it back on in the morning or, you know, just turn it off and turn it back on right before you go to bed, whatever. It gives it a chance to restart, refresh, updates go through, you know, uh, connections with servers and different things get reconnected, things work out. Am I doing all right, Mike? Is that, is that some of the reasons? Awesome, okay. So, today, I want us to start a series. We're going to begin and we're going to talk about this in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we'll see how long we go because we're calling this Reboot Discipleship. All right. I think that one of the oversights of you know, the church is that we tend to overlook this idea of discipleship. And so if you go and you look at the Bible, Jesus had a mission and a plan. He was accomplishing something. It was leading up towards you know, a specific objective. To reconcile man to himself, but then to do that, and he says, I'm not the one that's going to fulfill everything in the sense of, I did the work, I finished it, but now the work must continue. And that work continues through you, his people, his disciples. And so, if we were to look in the Bible, this is an area that we as a church today have given it very little thought, or we have, but then we kind of let it drop and we, we go, you know, it falls through the cracks. But it's the underlying mission of every single church. And it doesn't matter what the secondary distinctives are of a church, right? Some are really focused on baptism, so they're Baptists. Some are focused on, you know, uh, tongues, and so they're, they're, they're Pentecostal. So, you know, there's all these different distinctives that we have. But yet the underlying mission of the church is discipleship. Go and make disciples. And so, by way of introduction today, it, I want you to bear with me, because today we're going to ask a question, and we're going to deal with this question. Um, we're going to look at a scripture, but it's going to be an introductory message, all right? We're going to get into the more practical, the more, you know, theoretical and practical things as we go down this series. Today, I want to address the question, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? If we're going to talk about discipleship, we got to get some basics taken care of. 
Now, on TV or online, have you ever noticed some of those interviews where somebody will go out in the street and then they'll just start asking random people a question and you start getting people's opinions, right? It could be a survey. You know, we call it a man on the street interview. And um, if you stop somebody, you're going to get their opinion. Some people want to engage with you. Some people don't. If you ask 30 people the question, you're going to get just about 30 different answers. <laughs> There's not always consensus to what is being said. And some of those answers are comical. Some of those answers are just plain sad. My question is, what if we were to conduct a man on the street interview with this question? What is a Christian? What is a Christian? We stop a random selection of society out in public as they're going about their day, and we ask them, what is a Christian? Here's some of the things that you'll probably hear. You'll probably hear them say, you know what? Oh, a Christian is someone who believes in God. You know, there's a higher power out there. I don't really know his name or what he does or where he's at, but somewhere out there, there's a higher power. A Christian is a person that believes in that higher power. Okay. You might hear someone say, a Christian is someone who tries to live a good life and treat others right. You know, like they watch the movie Bambi and, and Bambi says, if you don't have something nice to say, you don't say anything at all. You know, treat others the way you want to be treated. Those, those are Christians. They, they ascribe to that. And, uh, you know, their good parts outweigh their bad parts. That, that's what a Christian is. You know, a Christian is someone who has Christian parents or a spouse. You know, it's kind of like a birthright. I was born a Christian. I was born into this thing. Oh, you know what? Yeah, my wife, she's a Christian. I'm Christian. We're Christ th this is a Christian family. Some of them might say, you know what? A Christian is someone who gives money to the church. That church, they, they have some good causes. They, they do some good things that, you know what? Uh, I, I, can, I can put my name to that. I kind of like that. Makes me feel good. And I, I'm a good person. So if the church is doing good things, I'm a good person, I'm going to support them financially. That's what you'll hear a Christian is. What about this one? Have you heard this one? A Christian is a person who goes to where? Goes to church. Yeah, they, they started attending a church some way, somehow. I don't know how they ended up there, but they did. And now they go there. They go there every Sunday. They go there sometimes in the middle of the week. Yeah, a Christian is a person that goes to church. Oh, not only that. A Christian is a person who has their name on some church membership roster somewhere. You know, I don't know where that list exists or where it is, but my name is on that list, and so I'm a Christian. What else? You can just say a whole bunch of others. Have you heard any of these? What is a Christian? There's all, oh, a Christian is a person that reads the Bible. A Christian is a person that prays. A Christian is a person that does this, that does that. There's all these different things. And I've heard all these answers before. And some of them I've heard from some of you of what a Christian is. But are these answers good enough? If we're rebooting discipleship, we're looking at this question of what is a Christian. We need to set the foundation so we can move forward. Are these answers good enough? Are they correct? And thankfully, we don't have to just say, I'll take someone else's opinion about it because we have a definitive source. It says here in, in the New Testament, Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, the word of God is theopneustos. God breathed. It's inspired of God. That means God breathed it through the authors. He breathed his inspiration into the gospel writers, into the prophets, into the men, and the men who wrote this book collection of books and it's his definitive word and so in here i want you to take your bibles and go to acts chapter 11 because god revealed in his inspired word what is a christian he revealed it so that we don't have to take someone else's opinion for it so if you're there acts chapter 11 verse 19 we're going to read a few verses and we'll see i got a lot of thoughts a lot of ideas we'll see how far we get but I want you to understand, right here, we can get a clear picture of what a Christian is. Acts 11, verse 19, it says this. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks, 
also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of grace of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people, and here it is, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Father, I pray that your word would just speak as basic as it is, as simple as it is that you would speak to us. Get us, Lord God, to a place where we can reboot this idea of being a follower, a disciple, a Christian, and that you would lead us, Lord God, in this next couple of weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So these three paragraphs, it it tells us about the Christians in the early town called Antioch. See, Antioch was, at the time, the third largest city in the Roman Empire. You had the largest of all, Rome, the capital. And Rome was chock full, and that's where the, the, the Senate sat, and, and all of the high elite leaders. And then you had the second largest city was Alexandria in Egypt a place of learning and knowledge, the scrolls that they had, the, the, the libraries that they contained. It was a large, large city. The third largest was Antioch. And Antioch was a place that was named after Antiochus, the, the emperor, the, the leader that was there, over the, one of the generals that was um, over that time, over that period. And it was a place that was busy and bustling. It was a place known for its idolatry and its pagan uh, rituals and beliefs. There was the worship of Daphne's in that place. And they had a lot of things that you wouldn't really associate with worship in today's you know, sense. Like you don't really see it happening in the church. Like they would get a little frisky in their church worship services in that place as they worshiped this Daphne's. Uh, there was a lot of immorality going on in their temples. And this is a place where it says they were first called Christians. In the midst of this large, secular, Roman-led, pagan society, city full with people, with immorality and you know, prostitution and all these different things that were happening, even in their temple worship, it says that they were first called Christians there. See, these people, I think that if we look at who they are, what they did, what they experienced, we get to understand what a Christian really was. And we get to extract that and apply that to us. So that we don't have to say, you know what, a Christian is a person that goes to church. A Christian is a person that sends his money to the church. We get to see what is a Christian really. What's happening in the life, the mind, the heart of a Christian. All right, so first thing I want you to understand is this. That what makes a person a Christian is that first of all, they hear the good news about Jesus Verse 20, he said, Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the good news. This, I told you, this is an introductory, simple message. But we have to understand that Christians are first and foremost marked not by anything else that they do, but they're marked first and foremost by their exposure and their, you know, receiving of the good news. And what is the good news? If we want to look at the good news, we got to kind of understand what the bad news is. And kids, help me out here. Help me out here. We all know this, right? Uh, That God created man. In his image and likeness, God had a perfect plan for man, yet man chose to do his own thing, right? We learned that Adam and Eve in the garden, they decided to rebel against God and disobey his commands, and so we introduced sin into the world. 
God has a perfect plan that he has for his children. I told you the story about my son and his love for bananas, right? And how he wants to eat bananas all the time. Well, the other day my son was, you know, we're outside and we're hanging out because he was too frantic inside the house. So we went outside and we're just sitting on the steps and he wants to get up. He wants to explore. He wants to get on the grass. So I let him go and he's just there. I'm sitting, I'm watching him and we have a little bit of space before we get to the road. But my son is going towards the road. He's going towards the road. And... If you've met my boy, Micah, he is absolutely devoid of this thing called fear. Like, he doesn't know what fear means. Like, it just it doesn't exist in his mind, in his heart, in, in his conception of reality. And so we could be at the pool, and he will just want to jump, jump right in. He gets mad at me at holding him back. Like, he wants me to let him go. And so there's no fear. Well, my son is going towards the road, so I get up, and I pick him up. And what does he do? He starts freaking out. And he like arcs his back, you know, he does all this stuff and it's like, if you don't have a good handle, you'll, you'll drop him. But he's going towards the road and I'm thinking to myself, kid, I'm doing this for your own good. Like, I see that this is not what is good for you. This is not what the way I need you to live because your life is going to be very short. If you live on the road where a car's coming through, you're going to get run over. So... I pull him out and I pull him back and he does it. He bucks up against that. See, God knows what life should be, how life should be lived. He has an order and a process. He has a way that he intended for us to experience him, experience life, and walk through this life. Yet, unfortunately, it tells us in Isaiah 53, it says this, that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We've intentionally disobeyed God. We've intentionally sinned. And so the Bible tells us that because of our sin, we get to reap the wages of that. You know, like like an employer. You go to work, right? I pray to God that everybody here who works at the end of the week or at the end of the month, the end of the pay period, whatever, they give you a check. I hope. If you're not getting a check, then you might need to check your employment because it's not a good deal, right? It's not a good deal at all. So like employment, if we work for sin, if we're employed by sin, when we cash in our paycheck, what we're going to get is death. That's what sin gives us. That's what it pays us. It doesn't pay us anything else. Maybe temporary pleasure in the moment, but then it's going to give us ultimately death. And that is eternal death that we're going to experience. We're going to experience death in this world because our, our lives, our relationships, you know, our, our experiences will be marred, will be broken, will be hurting. It will be filled with pain and sorrow. It will be filled with broken relationships. It will be filled with all these disappointments and regrets and guilt. But then ultimately at the end, when we stand before Jesus in God, it's going to lead to eternal death. So that's the bad news. Now, again, we know the good news. You've heard the good news. I pray to God that you've heard the news. If there's somebody who's never heard the good news, here it is. That God holds us accountable for our sins. Oh, that doesn't sound good yet. (laughs) He holds us accountable. You have lost touch with me. You have broken my commands. You have gone astray. And because of what Adam and Eve did, that has been imputed to all of mankind. Has anybody here ever taken a class on how to lie? Anybody here ever taken a class on how to swipe that piece of candy in the display case at Market Basket that says, you know, 25 cents each, whatever? Anybody here teach you how to steal one of those? Nobody. Why? Because it's imputed to us, sin, and that sin nature is imputed to us. It's automatic. It's what the flesh wants to do. It's it's who we are without God. And so that is the bad news. The good news is God holds us accountable to that. And because he holds us accountable to that, he says, you know what, I'm going to send a solution for that because you can't take care of it on your own. And so God gives us his son, Jesus Christ. Yes, we're all sons and daughters of God when we accept him. But Jesus is the son of God. The God made flesh. Emmanuel is what Isaiah says. The prince of peace. God sends his son so that we are able to be excused. 
He takes on the punishment of sin, the wages of sin, which is death. Jesus says, I will willingly take that. He goes to a cross. It's all imputed onto him. And he dies a sinless life, bearing the sins of all humanity. And the Bible tells us that on the third day, after being dead, he rises from the grave and he overcomes death, sin, and the grave. Amen? Amen. It says in Isaiah 53, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He takes the death sentence that we deserve. He does for us what we could never do for ourselves. And so the good news is that Jesus Christ has forgiven us if we simply receive that gospel. And so... That is number one. These people here, these Christians, they're not people who read, just read the Bible. They're not just people who go to a church or people who send in money, people who do all these different things that you might get in opinions, but they are people who are exposed to the good news of Jesus Christ. It is sad that there are people who say that they are Christians, that they go to church or do this and that, that they you know, have all these different conceptions, but yet they never have been exposed to the actual gospel. There's a story of a lady, and I'm skipping around here, but there's this lady, her name is Kathy. I came across her story. Kathy grew up in a polygamist family. She was the 13th child raised by one father and three mothers, all right? They lived in Utah, and they were part of the fundamentalist church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, all right? These guys were part of a sect. Growing up, she was burdened by the unrealistic expectation of that cult, and what was it? It was this. She said, we were constantly told to keep sweet. Keep sweet is what she would hear from her leaders and teachers, those who were proclaiming their version of the gospel. To be perfect, perfect obedience produces perfect faith. And so I need to keep sweet. But she was burdened by that because behind these sugary slogans lay the impossible duty of living out that complete obedience to the prophet. And who was their prophet? This man by the name of Joe, uh, Leroy Johnson. They called him Uncle Roy. And here's what he would tell his disciples. He would say to them, even though he was a feeble old man, he would prophesy that he would never die. He would prophesy to them that he'd become young again and that he would be lifted up into heaven. He would tell them that if they kept sweet in perfect obedience, which produces perfect faith, that he would take them up with him. And so she used to look forward to this day with great expectation and incredible fear at the same time. And what happened? What happens in a cult? The leaders of those faulty systems can't live up to the promises that they make, and so... When this man died at 93, it absolutely shattered Kathy's life. He was a man who was proclaiming this book, yet twisting so much of it. When he died, it ruined her faith. So she left, she escaped, and all that kind of stuff. Later down the road, she meets a man named Brian, and she uh, finds out that he's a Christian. He starts inviting her to church, and you know, they start praying together and all these different things. But one thing she noticed is that, you know what, Brian has a purpose in his life. He lives his life in a different way, and there's something strange, something different about him. And so she started telling him about her past in Mormonism and how it differed from the Bible, and they start talking about it. And she realized that God seemed to be more real and more in, and way different than what she always experienced. Guys, she realized that God was different than what she had been brought up to believe he was. How many times people think that God is X, Y, Z, but yet we don't pick up this book to understand who he really is. It's right here. All the answers are there. The promises are here. All right, so let's move on. What happens? One day she's talking to Brian about baptism. Uh, she hears Brian's mom talking about baptism and she starts asking many questions. You know what? Uh, what does a person need to do to be baptized? You know, um, what, is it a vow that you say? Is it a process that you go to, like a ceremony, a tradition? You know, how much do I have to pay? She asks all these questions to Brian's mom and she goes on to tell Kathy, baptism is free. Baptism is nothing more than an outward statement of an inward conviction it's a symbol of what has happened inside your heart that you're proclaiming on the outside of your body and so 
She admitted that she wasn't sure she's ever made that commitment. How do I get that faith? Stop and think about this. A person who's finally coming to the realization and she's asking that question, how do I make this commitment? Do, do, do I have to keep sweet in perfect obedience? Because that's her reference point. And Kathy's, uh, Brian's mom says to her, look, no good deeds will save you. The Bible teaches us that trusting in God, in Christ's finished work on the cross, that is what saves a person. So her next words, I just, I, I started breaking down when I heard this story. She said, I was amazed at the simplicity of the gospel message. And I cried as I realized I could come to Jesus Christ just as I am. He didn't require perfection for me, so I prayed and I received Jesus in my heart. How awesome it is, the simplicity of the gospel. Yes, this is a simple message, but I want you to understand, if you haven't fallen in love with the simple message of the gospel, have you overcomplicated it? Have you made it something that it doesn't need to be? And so the second thing, we are, yes, first exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but then the second thing that we absolutely need to do is that we have to believe. It says in verse 21 that these guys, the Lord's hand was moving with them, and a great number of people believed. See, Kathy believed that day that all she needed was to confess in Jesus Christ. The gospel is simple. God was working in Antioch on these Antiochians, and he's moving upon them to trust, to, to, to receive that message, and then put their faith in God. You know, here's the deal. When we hear the gospel, and we choose to believe, what we need to do here is we're not just making an intellectual assent. See, a lot of people treat the gospel and religion and faith and all that stuff as an intellectual assent, like a mountain I am climbing, like a little bit of knowledge that I am acquiring. See, intellectual assent is a decision that is made in my head that lacks the commitment in my heart. That's intellectual assent. You know, for an example, you know, people could be walking out in the woods. There might be a river coming through and a cliff and a chasm or whatever. And as they're walking in that path, they see a bridge that is made up of ropes and held up by planks. It appears to be a strong enough place for them to pass and cross the chasm. But until the person is willing to take a step onto that bridge, all the person has done is made an intellectual ascent. Same way with faith. Same way with Jesus Christ. Many people understand that the Lord Jesus died on a cross. Many people have a cross of Jesus and him hanging on it in their rooms or their houses or on pictures. They've seen it in movies and they, you know, it's pop culture. We understand it. Okay, many people realize that the Lord died to pay for our sins. But until you have actually said, you know what, I'm going to place my trust in his death on the cross, that he will be Lord and Savior of my life, all you've done is intellectually ascend it. Because it's a decision made up here that is lacking the commitment of the heart. These people in the book of Antioch, in the midst of that pagan religion, pagan society, where everybody is doing everything that is against God's way of living, these people said, oh, wow, the gospel's simple. I believe that he's for me. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. And I am going to place my life in alignment with him. So, when we come towards the gospel and we are exposed to it, there needs to be a decision. We can decide that we say, intellectually, it sounds good, sounds right, sounds needed, necessary, but it's a whole nother thing for us to actually put our names, sign on the dotted line and say, I receive that in my heart. I receive that in my life. And so we could either choose to receive it or we can choose to walk away from it. My question is, do you believe? Do you believe today? Is God opening up your eyes to truth like he opened up Kathy's? And that transformed her life. All right, the next one. Let's look at one more. 
Verse 21. Again, not only did these guys hear the gospel, they believed the gospel, but it says right there in the next couple of words, and they turned to the Lord. They turned to the Lord. See, if we're going to reboot discipleship, let's blow apart the misconceptions that it's those who just go to church. There are so many who go to church that have never turned. Have we, I don't know, if, I, le, I love movies. I like watching movies. I, I think that there's, you know, talent and ability. God's given us so much creative power and ability. And when somebody can picture, you know, scenes and movies and dialogues that move the heart, I, I, I just love that. There's this movie called The Blind Side, which is based on true life. I don't know if you've seen it, but for all those of you who like sports, football especially, go watch it. It's a good movie because it's based on true events. Sandra Bullock won the 2010 Best Actress Academy Award for portraying Lee and Tui in that movie. And so uh, it's a sensational movie that chronicles uh, a young man, this family, this Christian family, who ends up taking a homeless young man whose life is just chaotic and broken. He's homeless at this point. And they, you know, take him into their home, adopt him, and help him realize his God given potential. And this young man, Michael Orr, he ends up not only dodging his hopelessness and his brokenness of his homelessness, but he overcomes a dysfunctional inner city life that he was brought up in, and he goes on to become the first round NFL pick for the Baltimore Ravens back in 20, uh, 2009. You know, at an event where the real life family was at a fundraiser event, Steve Tui, the, the husband, all right, was at, or Sean, I'm sorry, his name is, um, he was asked a question concerning that experience. And somebody asked him, you know, how did this all start? Sean turns around and he says to somebody, he says, you know what, it all started with two words. When they spotted Michael walking along the road on a cold November morning, all right, in the movie it's at night, but in real life it was in the morning, he was walking in shorts and a t-shirt, Lee Ann uttered two words as they're driving past this young man. She says, turn around. And that's where it started. Turn around. Turn around. And the fact that they turned around, they opened up their door. They opened up their life. They opened up the possibilities that changed not only their families, but the life of this young man. It changed the team. It changed, you know what I'm saying? It impacted so many people. Turn around is all they said. See, church, those same two words can make a difference in our lives today. Those same two words can change anyone's life. It, can, it doesn't matter if you're a kid in elementary school. It doesn't matter if you are an octogenarian, you know, just thinking your life is done, like you've done everything and accomplished everything you needed to be in your old age. It does not matter. Those two words can change anyone's life. When we turn around, we change the direction of our lives. These guys change the direction of the car, where it was going. When we turn around, we say, I was going this way with my life, my choices, my decisions, my beliefs, my habits. Now I'm going this way. These people turned around. You know what? In, in the church world, what is that word called? It's called repentance. When we repent, we say, I'm going to, Lord, I've grieved you, I've hurt you, I've done things that you don't want me to do, so I'm gonna turn around, I'm gonna repent from here, and I'm gonna go this way. I'm gonna choose to do what you've called me to do. Repenting has to do with owning up to the truth of who we are and where we're headed, and knowing that God has a good place. Like my son wanted to go the road, I wanted him to turn around and come to a better place, come to a better reality, and serve a safe environment. And so, you know, when we hear the good news, we hear it. Thank God we've had the opportunity and privilege to hear it. But then we have to place our trust in it and believe in it. But beyond that, we have to move in that place and say, God, I've heard it, I received it, and now I realize there's things in my life that need to change. And I gotta repent and turn. And when we do that, we get to experience, like in verse 23, it says that these guys here, when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, when we receive the gospel, trust it, and then we turn from our wicked ways, we get to experience God's grace and his favor. 
God's grace and his favor. And that is not just grace so that we could come to him. Yeah, he does that inner working through the Holy Spirit to start changing us and wanting and creating a desire. Have you ever had popcorn at a movie theater? All right. How many of you just buy a bucket of popcorn and that's all you do? Do you usually buy anything to drink with it? Absolutely. Because popcorn, there's salt in there, and salt makes us thirsty. We want to drink, like, we want to quench that thirst. And so the Holy Spirit comes, and he starts peppering our lives and salting our lives, and he starts putting those, those desires and yearnings for God. When we come to him, we have to trust. Then we repent, and when we do so, that grace that started the process becomes the grace that we experience in empowerment. The grace that we experience in order to say, you know what, I can't do this on my own and say I'm going to stay away from sin, but I get to experience the empowerment of God to continue moving forward in strength to resist the enemy. And that grace, it, it overflows in so many ways. I love the psalmist. He said that, you know, his cups, his cup overflowed. That God prepared a banquet for him in the presence of his enemies. That that is God's grace. You see, grace is when we experience something that we don't deserve. I'm like, God is teaching me so much through being a parent. And so if you get tired of hearing about my son, I apologize. But we this kid makes an absolute mess. I told you about his uh, you know, Pollock impressions on the floor with all of his food. You know, he makes a mess when he's eating. And sometimes this kid knocks over his glass, his cup, and all this stuff, and he makes an absolute disgusting mess with milk and food and wet food and dry food and all this kind of stuff on the floor. (coughs) In that moment, as a human being, I get irritated. I'm not supposed to react, my wife tells me, as she's reading all these awesome books about parenting. I'm not supposed to like, get really frustrated because he's exploring, he's figuring things out, and this is part of the process for him to develop. He needs to be able to touch his food, it needs to get messy, and I can't be over there overprotective trying to you know, make everything clean and proper. But I get mad because what's going to happen? As soon as he's done eating, he says, all done, he goes like this, all done, sign language, all done, and take him out of the seat I go and I take him over to play and he's playing with his little farmers and and all this toys and whatever and um, you know what am I doing I'm on my knees you know trying to get the beans off my knees and off my socks and the, the rice that's sticking and the mango and whatever it is and I'm wiping the floors in that moment I don't really feel an overwhelming sense of joy and ex and 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 love for my son I'm being real, okay? In that moment, I'm saying, you little dude, why don't you come and clean this up? You don't deserve to be over there. I look at you, you're over there having fun, playing, and enjoying. You're over there like not a care in the world, and I'm over here paying the price for something you did. I'm over here sacrificing my time, getting down on my knees, getting dirty in the muck and the mire of this dirty food, of this spilt milk, and all this stuff, while you get to be over there and just rest in your identity knowing that you're my son. Is that not the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is that not when we are in our sins broken and lost? As Christians, Jesus comes down and he says, you don't deserve to go play right now because of all that you've done. You don't deserve to enjoy yourself at this moment. Why? Because you have done something that is broken, something that is wrong, and something that requires a cleanup, a major cleanup. You have destroyed the plans. You have made something that wasn't intended to be. You've brought it upon, and you know what? You've brought it upon me. Yes, you've brought it upon yourself, but I'm going to do something because of what you did and you get to experience my grace. I love that. So a Christian is not a person that goes to church. A Christian is not a person that reads his Bible. A Christian is not just a person that gives money to the church or a person that thinks that there's a higher power or a person that has their name on a membership roster. A Christian is a person who's encountered the gospel. A Christian is a person who's trusted in the gospel. A Christian is a person who has turned from his wicked ways and said, God, I need you, and by default experiences God's grace. 
That is what a Christian is. And as we move forward in this series, next week we're going to talk about discipleship, what it means to be a disciple. And we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of being a follower of Jesus. I'm not sure if you're going to like the sermon next week because it's going to touch on a subject that is a little bit challenging. But I invite you, if you're courageous and bold, I want you to come on back. Here's the deal. I want to leave you, with, leave you with this story. Well, I'll conclude. I've gone over my time. Uh, team, you can come on back up. We'll worship God. Get ready to praise him and, and all that stuff. But here's the deal. I came across a prayer of a man, and he was being v- really r- vulnerable and raw. And I think it's an excellent prayer because I have been in this prayer. I have, I have said these things or thought these things. Maybe I haven't said it explicitly, but I've thought them in my heart, and I've acted in this way. And so listen to what this supplicant had to say. As he's sitting down and praying, he says, God, I almost, I was almost your person today. I was almost your person today, Lord. Almost. And then he thought, what would it have been like if Jesus had done the same thing? What would it have been like? What if God had almost revealed himself in Jesus Christ? What if, in, what if Christ had almost been born, almost lived, almost died? What if he had said, ask and it will almost be given unto you? Seek and you will almost find, knock and the door will almost be opened. What if he had said, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened and I will give you rest Almost. What if Jesus told his disciples, for you to lose your life, you got, you'll gain it if you lose it. And if you gain your life, you're going to lose it. Almost. What if he had said that and he changed the script? My almost Christianity took on a much different light. If we stop and think about this, we're thinking about disciples and Christians and what a Christian is. What if we throw this almost into the picture? We're going to start realizing how many times I've played the game of being one of Jesus' almost disciples, being his almost answer. I recalled how many times I've prayed almost believing, how many times I've walked through my days as if he was almost risen. It's not a question of theology, it's a question of our lifestyle, church. It's not a question of the the theory behind it that a Christian is a person who believes in a higher power. It's a question of our lifestyles. And our lifestyles will back up the fact that we've been exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we have decided to place our trust and say, God, I see the bridge, I see the planks, it gets me across the chasm, I'm gonna walk across it. It's not an almost thing. It's a lifestyle thing to say, you know what? Yeah, God. I almost rejected these images. I almost, God, said no to this debilitating habit. No, it's the lifestyle that says I've repented and I've changed. Whether or not I have a lifestyle that can match what I believe, whether or not my walk can back up my talk. That is what a Christian is. And so I want you to stand with me this morning. If you have never received the gospel, you've never heard that news that you have committed sin, you have been lost, you've gone astray from God's plan, you're headed towards imminent death and yet God has made a way for you. If you've never heard that before and you want to say, you know what, today I want to place my trust in that. Today I want to say, Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart, my life. And, and, and let me live and experience that grace that you have. If that's you, I want to just pray a prayer with you. So if you've never done that, just raise your hand right now. I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray a prayer with you and include you in a prayer. I trust everybody has gone through that step, which is awesome. So this morning, let's pray together. God, I hope, I hope, Lord Jesus, as pastor in this place, Lord Jesus, for myself personally, first and foremost, but then God, to your people that are here, that Lord Jesus, we would just reboot our understanding of what it means to be a Christian.
If, God, we've been nominal by nature and just, Lord Jesus, got complacent and, and got comfortable in these opinions, God, I pray that you would stir our hearts and our minds, that we would step away from that and say, Lord, am I really considering your gospel today? Am I really, Lord God, banking everything that I have? I am buying it, Lord Jesus, hook, line, and sinker. I am, Lord God, placing everything. I'm all in on trusting that your truth is the truth. For you said that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And none come to the Father if not through him. God, I pray that you would encourage us this morning that we would repent from our wicked ways. Repent from the things that just grieve your heart and your mind. And God, that you would set us, Lord Jesus, set us up, God. Set us up, not to fail, but to succeed with the grace and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. To live lives dedicated to you, trusting in you, and Lord God, becoming beacons of your gospel in our world. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.